And welcome to the Reason and Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Friday evening, joined by our resident scholar, Dr. Matthew Minard, and also friend. How are you, Dr. Minard? Good to have doing, you on. Doing really well. Although it's like, you know, raise my eyebrow, resident scholar, but I'm not Mr. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You're like zooming down on the on the road there, and William Albrecht's got all the neon. I'm like, he's in the nice district of town now. <laughs> He, he did get some extra neon, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> I just, he stuck out to me, right? A famous man. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it was great. I was really, really, really proud to see him on there. It was, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was awesome. I was really excited to see that. And, and Father K did really, really well also. I know. He does um, really for being someone as brilliant as he is and well read as he is and, you know, pedantic as he is. He's he's a good pastor, so he knows how to just just kind of meet the level of what like, exactly exactly yeah. because they, there are those people out there they're extremely intelligent but they can't communicate it to the average person. Yeah. Whereas that's not the case with him. He was able to break down very very tough concepts and and communicate it yeah. in a way that I think anybody who is watching could understand effectively. Yeah, so he's, I, he's able to reach into names. I mean, better than I am, right? Like I I can't I start throwing names around and I I get people lost. He knows I got to go and explain, or I have to he mm. gives that little detail that contextualizes whoever he's talking about. That's the pastor. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. He, he, did, he did do a good bit of pastor. He was even down in like South America for a little bit, you know, um, you know, it's wow. been asked him to do it. It's, it's hard. It's hard probably to be a, that conservative of a priest. So but he did. I mean, he, can, he speaks Spanish very well and he, you know, he was used to just doing pastoral work like that. He, yeah. So. Because I, I, I've heard that he and William go on radio shows and, and do shows entirely in Spanish. Yeah, it doesn't surprise, it doesn't surprise me that they do it. Because there was a period there he was doing Spanish masses. There must only be like one in Pittsburgh. It's Pittsburgh for crying out loud. Mm. Um, but he, he was doing it for the Roman diocese to help them out. And I didn't realize oh. he could preach fully and fine in, in Spanish. But yeah. But you, that, you know, does he thousands well, of languages? You know what's one? Well, well yeah, I, I I figured he knows a lot. I wonder if he does the uh, Trident Team Mass as well, or if. Oh he yeah, he, he was an old time. He was an old time Indog guy. Oh like, really? From the old wow. Days. Wow. So before um before Sumor uh, Sumorum Pontificum, I guess Ecclesia Day Indog. Yeah, yeah. It was wow. under that he had a parish out in Indianapolis because where he's incarnate incarnated. He um he got rid of some of his books. Um, the last year, just you know, paring stuff down. And I'm going through. I'm like, these are tratty old books. <laughs> and I open them, and it said from you know, ex libris Father Christian Capus. Yeah, <laughs> translate and some like devotional stuff. I'm like, you know, sometimes you know, old priests have this stuff, but the Franzelin. I was like, what yeah. in the world? <laughs> Franzelin in Latin doing in the Byzantine. He had Franzelin. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so and, I mean, he he would then know the Novus Ordo, the Tridentine Mass, and Eastern rites. I think. Yeah, yeah, because he's oh. probably even he's probably ritually comfortable because he's gonna be comfortable in the Melkites and Ruthenian recensions within the Eastern Catholic. I'm sure he's familiar with whatever's going on in the Greek Orthodox world with him having been over at Thessaloniki all that time. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Man, incredible stuff. Yeah, so like these famous people, you know. You yeah. Dollar. It's like, you know, <laughs> President Little little Moon in the orbit of, you know, Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Right? Good it's stuff. Like, just to, you know, be at the gateways of the house of the Lord is a great joy. What, great joy. Th what do you have? Uh, co coffee over there? I'm actually going to do a Modelo here. I, uh, oh, no. This is... Hey. I, I actually have a Modelo. I rarely have alcohol, but here I, I got a case of these, so I got to get rid of them. <laughs> You're so, so, uh, so abstemious. Uh, no, I, you know, having spent the day outdoors a bit today, I, you know, I'm tired. So, like, I don't want to get, you know, somewhere around the theological virtues and start, you know, <laughs> off, not in divine ecstasy, right? It won't be. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so, yeah, we're talking about the. It's fine, but it's just when you're tired, you know, it can hit you. Right. Even one beer can hit you. So. 
<laughs> no, just well, tea, just tea, Mr. Professor. Yeah, I um believe it or not, I I probably couldn't do any more than this anyway. I'm oh, a lightweight just great. because I drink so little that yeah. just very little is is about all I can handle. You know, yeah. not that I go crazy afterwards. I'm just saying, no, you you start to feel a little yeah, you can you know, feel it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, thankfully it's like, you know, in my family you say I'm littered with this, but like luckily too, that's what it's like for me. You know, you mm -hmm. get like strong beer and it's like you yeah, know, good cocktail, but it's like the set you second cocktail, you just feel scads over, you know, which is good because it's a good place to be. <laughs> I can't love my in laws either. It's like Irish. I mean, they're just <laughs> an Irish wedding. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> we, you know, with it, my wife's family closed out the in laws. My father in law looked over at me. Aren't we the best family? He said, <laughs> I am. Yeah. Three thirty. Like that Irish, that Irish joke on on some show. They, they said uh, there are more alcoholics per capita than people in Ireland. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> by the by the way, I meant to ask you when when you spent your time in the monastery, did they have beer or anything like that? Oh yeah, St. Vincent's actually kind of you know. So banter. Enjoy your Friday evening, folks. Uh, but, you know, I was trying to put the kids down anyway, so we got time. St. Vincent, actually, because they were from Bavaria, their founder was kind of, rom you know, ro that whole era of romanticism, right? So around the time Salem was also affecting things liturgically. So you just had, mm. you had trying to refound orders, you know, mm -hmm. um, because they had been, they had been squashed in Europe. And uh, Boniface Wimmer, I mean, he was more of a diocesan priest, really, than a monk. But they were Bavarians, and so their table wine was beer. So they had a brewery, and uh, they also owned some tavern up at one of their mission areas. They got in trouble with the Irish bishops, because that's the era of, like, John Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. And just the Irish bishops in general are trying to be Americanized. And they do see, like, a lot of the, the Irish immigrants from, like, the 1840s, who would be railroad workers, um, just you know, the, the effects of the drinking you know, out mm. the men working out in the Midwest. So they're, they're actually kind of pairing up the prots for, for, um, you know, pro early, like proto prohibition. Well, right. when, when they finally became a priory, Pius the ninth actually included permission for them to have their own private beer. It's in their, it was in their priory, their independent priory charter. You know that I don't even know if, how much they do that nowadays. They do though. Silverstream was a priory, so um, for a while. So uh, or is it still whatever it is, a priory still exists. It's like independent from the bishop, but they're not yet an abbey. Mm -hmm. And he put it in there that they, their the local bishop of Pittsburgh could not stop them from having their own beer. Wow. Um, and even made a joke reference to that that bit from St. Paul, right, to Timothy about take a little bit of you know wine with your water. Right. It's in the it's in the letter, I think, that's attached to the actual decree. <laughs> so they had a brewery until like the 20, well, to prohibition. And then there happened to be a fire in the, the brewery on property. And so they just stopped brewing. But a bunch of I mean, they 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 drew 30% even while I was there. We're still from some of the old German enclaves, like where they used to get high school students who then became vocations mm -hmm. you can't eat from those guys you know beers they had it stocked i mean you could get beer technically whenever you wanted it like you know <laughs> gas you know now as a junior you'd be in trouble that's going to be sure. watched sure um, but you know i never actually saw i mean I, you know you know people who did have their issues um uh but the only real tragedy and it's it's both tragic and i know the man and so there's something like oh it it it, it fit the poor man's end of life. So it's really, I'm not trying to make light of it. I knew someone though, who his end was in, in the, the food that was there because he was a diabetic who went and ate and there he choked and died in there. Mm. And I was like, you know, I was like poor father rip, you know, couldn't control himself. And he ends up going and doing that. But you know, the booze is not a problem, right? Like it's so weird. You're like, he was a, he was, he was just an old, I used to read to him. I mean, he was a sweet old Italian man who just had too much, he had too much of a sweet tooth. And this was a problem. We were like trying to stop him. And I just, it always stuck with me. I'm like, I've never, I've never seen the alcoholics that I did know went and got hard booze from elsewhere. Like you never know how this stuff gets into a monastery, you know, and it's, or prior, you know, it was the prior was a very down to earth man. Like yeah. I didn't have a good relationship with the arch habit, but I did like the prior and he knew how to handle this and try and like, get around it and like, you know, find the people who are in AA who could help them, you know, but how that stuff just get in, would get in there. And I'm like, the it's beer is, they just drink themselves to death on the beer. And they luckily didn't. Um, 
Yeah, they they and then we had a we actually had a liquor cabinet, but it was closed except for holidays, right? They they'd use it at Christmas dinner. They'd bring out a, a cart. So, but I always oh. say that's where I got my first taste for decent liquor because I. Grew <laughs> <up>. <laughs> so it's you know. Always wash, Chair, choose, choose what you give your, what funds you give your money to, right? right. Health, the health fund, not the general fund. Right. But, <laughs> but truth be told, nothing we had was ever extravagant. I mean, it was it lo the local beer from the, the hometown, the German settlement area. They had a brewery up in Northern Pennsylvania. So it was like from there. And when we had table wine, to be honest, looking back, it was cheap stuff. It really was. My novice master was this very genteel, European, Hungarian, and he, you know, he, he settled for it very well. He dealt with it, you know, with a stiff upper lip. He had, he had friends who would treat him to nice meals on occasion, but yeah. Anyway, that was a long, I, long I, um, I didn't think I was going to go. As soon as I went down the rip line, I was like, I got to think of a way to tell the rip story. I didn't seem, I'm not joking. I, I felt very kind to him, but it is like, poor man. It's kind of like, there's this poetic justice. Like I remember the nurses I'd go read to him and then, complain on Friday nights, you know, Oh, you know, they're going to have those desserts down there. Uh, yeah. I read it for us all. <laughs> Canical for Leibowitz. I read to him. It was the last book I read to him. Have you ever read, read that? Wait, which one was it? Canical for Leibowitz, something mm -hmm. Miller. Oh, it's an interesting text. I mean, he kind of became weird new agey, but it's a ca very Catholic text about how like the world ends a nuclear Holocaust and monks huh. all the world together. Huh. Guy book. I couldn't I believe not read that it, he really. wanted it to be read to him. He'd get like Butler's Lives of the Saints and then this like 1960s sci-fi Catholic book. <laughs> and then, so you got me going. I'm an extrovert. You guys are like, why are we telling stories? But this is, you know, these are these amusing church stories. There was another monk. Uh, he, he was a real man's man. He, he worked at our fire department that we had on campus, uh, chaplain in the military before beforehand. And uh, he was reading as well. And he just apparently wanted me to repeat whatever he read. So he was getting mad at me that I'm skipping chapters. And Father Roland was saying, well, no, we already read that. So, you know, he was like, he was getting every other chapter, you know, is there something was happening? He, he got mad, mad about it. I didn't realize that he was reading to him as well at the same time. <laughs> I was just trying to do my good deed to rip. We called him Rip. Father Rip. Father Rip. 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 Father, rest in peace. <laughs> rest in peace. Rip. Rest in what, peace. A, what a name. <laughs> yeah, Roland. Well, Roland Rapoli. So it was Rapoli was his last name, but we call huh. him. So that's funny. <laughs> anyway, I, man, monasteries create so many stories, though, that one of my conferences said, I mean, you would not think that the stuff's true. <laughs> and not, I can only it's, imagine. It's just, just, they're just amusing stories. I was telling stories last night to a relative that happened to ask something it's an endless wall of like funny stories <laughs> i could only imagine yeah <laughs> well we'll save those for a later day uh but yeah talking there about you know it, uh you know lacking a little bit of temperance there uh we're, we're going into the virtues today so i'll, <laughs> I'll let you take it away and uh dive in all right. Yeah, it's a good good transition. So, all right. Uh, treat us on human acts is what we did last time. We're going to now do mostly, oh, an overview broadly based on the treatise on on virtues in Aquinas's Prima Secundae in the uh, Prima uh, in the Summa Theologiae. So, whenever you're looking kind of architectonically through the, that section of the Summa, if we recall from our earlier lectures. The moral part of the Summa begins with the treatise on Beatitude, and it's the most important treatise. For those of you who happen to come from the East, you can think of it as at least partially a treatise on theosis. Now, I would argue it needs to be developed so that you can include those themes a little bit, right? But it's all there. The seeds are there. That Aquinas says, based on a heavily Aristotelian model, you got to start with your end. Your end is the life of grace. It's living the divine life. It's beatitude. You know, it's actually the, the vision and the hereafter is what magnetizes the whole of our moral life. So he sticks that first. So you can build that out, you know, in, in, in a Thomistic tradition uh, that would be right in line with Aquinas as, you know, an extended treatise on the last end of man and theosis. And he, he also treats some of that later on in his treatise on grace in general. That's going to be actually our last our last lecture here on the Prima Secundae. After that, in our last lecture, we had a 
three or four weeks ago, we're a little behind, um, <clears throat> was on human acts. Because human reason or human reason illuminated by faith, in the case of uh, those who have grace um, in the supernatural order, is the proximate, it's the closest rule of human acts. It's not the ultimate measure of our action, right? The, human morality is not relativistic, but for, for Aquinas, the virtue of prudence, the virtue of right reason applied to action, that would be kind of philosophically what would be uh, operative here, and right reason illuminated by faith, also docile to the Holy Spirit, applied to action, which would be infused prudence, which we're going to talk about more today, is the immediate measure of our acts as we reason through what we should do in order to achieve virtuous ends. So he deals with that as a principle of human acts after talking about beatitude. So you can think of it as he's putting together the pieces of the various principles um, operative in, in human agency, uh, divinized human agency, right? Because of course, this is all within the context of a, of a theological explication of you know, the mysteries of faith, which include our supernatural destiny um, as believers and as, as those who have been given the grace of Christ. So then after that, he, he picks up with the treatise on the passions and the habits and habits, but it's more than habits. We're going to see here in a second. It's, it's really uh, the term sometimes could be just taken as habitus, but it's stable, stable dispositions uh, that are operative and ready to help us choose to do good acts. So we'll get to that in a second. I'm not going to do the whole of the discussion of the passions, but we're going to discuss the outlines so that we can then understand how <clears throat> in broad outline uh, the virtues and the passions or the rest of the human, uh, so to speak, organism or psyche uh, uh, interact in constituting a human act. So really we're going to be moving our conversation today toward an overview of Aquinas on the, on the virtues. Uh, but first, uh, just a tiny bit about uh, his psyche of his setup of the soul. So, for Aquinas, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the way that he looks at our desires is indebted to the Platonic and Aristotelian tradition uh, that sees us as having ultimately two types of desire and reaction, maybe we'll just say emotive reaction. I'm, I'm being a little loose with language here to our environment at the level of our psyche that we share with other animals. So <clears throat> in the, in the universe of it's really Plato, right? Plato's whole universe is some somewhat magnetized by, by love all throughout the cosmos, but for Aristotle as well, um, all things act in a teleological fashion for an end. And so all things are impelled by at least a kind of natural love to, to achieve what they are you know, created to achieve, although he wouldn't use the word created, but to achieve the formal activity that they are meant to attain for their full perfection. All things have that sort of natural desire. But among the types of beings that exist uh, in the universe, there are um, animals which have sense powers which are not merely external senses, the ability to see and hear and, and taste, smell, uh, to, to feel your environment through touch, but also too, the, the array of what Aristotle develops as internal senses, which then contemporary psychology, when it's not behavioristic, could technically develop as well. And I'm not as versed in, in sort of the, the, the technicalities of that literature. Someone like Dr. Daniel DeHaan would actually be very good to, to read on how contemporary psychology maps uh, onto Aristotelian powers of the soul. But in Aristotle and then developed through the Greeks and Arabs, eventually an array of internal senses uh, develops <clears throat> in, in the philosophical articulation of our psychology. We see this in animals that they have, you know, the, the ability to, to remember things that they've been trained to do and also based on their memory to learn new things. So you know, weasels, weasels, the mighty weasel. Um, we were watching a PBS documentary with my daughters the last night or the night before. Um, the honey badger is in the weasel family. It's a very intelligent animal that based on its memory is able to, you know, come up with new solutions to problems. I mean, higher apes, of course, do this as well. 
These abilities are considered uh, to be attached to a series of powers, above all to the memory and what's called the estimative sense. And you can just think of those as general clusters of abilities that whatever modern psychology says are pretty phenomenologically spot on. That the memory, uh, that the animal through its memory is in touch with its past, its own past. Um, and its own past is not merely the passive um, interaction with the environment. It, it's its past as an actor. It remembers the sorts of things that it was able to do in the past, the way that the environment reacted, et cetera, and how it itself reacted to it. And the formation of that kind of knowledge that deals with how to interact with the environment is handled by what the later, really the Arabs and scholastics called the, the estimative sense, the power to estimate whether you should do something, should, should avoid something, or maybe be neutral in relation to it. So those are there as these highest, uh, intel, uh, well, not intellective, but knowledge-based powers that the, the animal has. They're, they're like the intellect in the case of the human, and they'll be very important in human intellection. But coupled with that, on this part of the soul, and we can think of the, the ancient ideas of I the image in Plato of the charioteer with reason, watching the two passions, the two major types of passions, the passions of desire and the passions of fear and anger right? Usually in, 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 in the context of Plato, it's thumos. It's, it's mostly um, anger and spirit on the one hand and desire on the other. These will come to be called by the scholastics the passions of concupiscence uh, and the irascible appetite, the angry appetite. But of course, words words clunk a little bit whenever you uh, whenever you use terms, and especially here, I think, quite a bit the irascible appetite actually involves, you know, a number of different uh, reactions that the sensing animal can have to, to uh, its environment, his or her environment. Not only anger, but also fear and aversion and even daringness and hope. Um, not hope in the theological sense, but basically the inclination of soul to go after a certain good that is desirable, and we're going to talk about that in a second, and that it really can be pursued. The animal that knows that it can at least attempt to catch something will have a kind of hope that drives it on in that, that task. And that driving on is, is the, the experience of the passion of hope in that case. Whereas, you know, you despair at something that can't be done. And so, you know, you, you have a reaction to the environment such that you, you stop acting. It's like my oldest daughter, my wife says, it's the, the mark of a melancholic here um, that she, you know, she'll say, I'm tired if she finds something too hard. Uh, her father's a raging choleric. Uh, was just enough sanguine in him to make him, you know, interactive with others. But um Anyway, so I, I've got a lot of the era, the irascible anger part in my personality. Well, okay, so the irascible is a little bit awkward, but the, the term concupiscible for the desiring passions or the passions of love, we could even say, love and joy, really. Um, the, the, uh, the term concupiscence can confuse people, A, because it's weird, but B, those who know just enough also know that, that the term usually attaches to the negative experience of our desires that are disordered because of the effects of the fall. All of these passions in us are not subject to the higher powers of the soul in the way they should be because of the effects of, of the loss of, of grace, which have redounded down to the whole of our psyche, have affected uh, all of our various uh, passions, have thrown upside down. The, the structure and architecture of the soul. Not so much that our, our soul is corrupted, but it is, you know, in it's fallen and we're, we live in a state in which we limp along. We have the effects of the fall in us. And forever, the effects of the fall and original sin remain a kind of tinder for sin. Fomes peccati, as the, the medieval Latin uh, term went. But even the animal can have at knowledge once again, not merely knowledge through external senses, but above all, knowledge through its ability to estimate and also how it reacts to its mem its memories as well. Um, 
you know, the most fundamental of desires, which is a, a love for that which seems to be befitting and good, right? So the, the highest animal that has taken, you know, a love for its master. So this is not the case with my, my father-in-law's dog has no love for me because I have very little love for it um, or for him because I'm not an animal person. But uh, for my father-in-law, the dog has a, a, a reaction of love for him such that he'll seek him out. So like, you know, whenever one time we forgot to have the fence that my father-in-law put in here, one of those little buried wires, it had snowed in December and we forgot to turn it on and the dog ran away down the road. And I mean, you know, the poor thing would have potentially gotten killed because we live in a rural area and it just would run off. Um, so he heard my father-in-law's voice and immediately, you know, has a desire for the for the absent person whom he loves, love actually drives this whole thing. But another passion you can have is the reflection of desire for the absent beloved. And then you know you take joy in in the presence of a good that is that is you know in now in your presence and now achieved. And all of these will actually have some anal not all of these actually, but some of these will have analogs in in our spiritual life, especially joy, love, desire. There will be spiritual emotions of a sort that would would be akin to these as well. But strictly speaking, in, Ar in Aristotle's world, in Aquinas's world, but Aristotle's as well, these passions as well as hatred, sadness, and aversion, or uh, or not, yeah, or yeah, aversion would be. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. I may have a term that's wrong there on my, my list actually, and I'm trying to think what it is. But the the reaction that you have sorrow uh, sorrow to a, a good that's present that you can't get away from, you know, or a hatred for a good that is or an evil. I should say an evil that is just whether present or not, you hate it. Um, but uh, all of those, I apologize. I have something I think wrong in my notes and now I'm like fixating on it. All of those emotional reactions that you're going to have, whether it be to an evil that's present or not, to a, a good that's present or not, at the level of sensation are the passions for um, for Aquinas and for, for Aristotle. Um, and these will need to be ruled and measured, in our case, by the higher powers. And we're going to kind of doubly have to do that because not only do we have an intellect and a will, but through the gift of grace, we have a divinized intellect that has been illuminated by the gift of faith, um, as well as then a will that has been set ablaze, both with supernatural hope as well as supernatural charity. But let's work our way up. So, of course, in the, in the basic... Uh, philosophical anthropology that Aquinas inherits both from Aristotle and the Augustinian world uh, in which he lives. You have these higher powers of intellect and will, which are the spiritual grasp of, uh, you know, rea of other realities, uh, the fully spiritual grasp. I'll just put a pin there if anyone wants to ask what I mean by that. In the case of the intellect, that the intellect understands through the intellect we understand the essences of things as well as get in touch with their existence and reason about them um and then we have a correlative desire that follows from that we can see not only a desire for goodness in itself actually everything that we do we do precisely because we have a desire and a thirst to do that which is good it's the most basic inclination of the will we talked about that a bit last lecture but also, too, we grasp the idea of, for instance, temperance. We were talking about uh, Father Rip. But, you know, we could we could also say, you know, with regard, we were talking as, about having a, a beer with the, the talk. I like having, having beer or a drink, but I'm tired today. And so I have to exercise, you know, the, the virtue of temperance. I have to think and see that it's good to, to use uh, to use drink like that in a way that is measured in a way that, that fits the reasonable goals of fulfilling my duties and obligations to all of you as, as listeners and watchers, but also to, to reason and theology. This can go all sorts of, we can go all sorts of ways. So you have desires that, that attach to different institutions, ultimately desires to, that attach to other persons in friendship. Uh, all, the highest desire that the will can have even by nature is, is a, uh, a desire to, to know and love God to the degree it's possible by our natural powers. 
that all of these are within the, the ambit of the spiritual desire that is the will. Very important to see that that's there. Very important to see that those who say that 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 idea of affectivity is not present in Aquinas, those people are, are off. It's there in the Thomists, even if they don't talk about it all the time. The good sister Mary Veronica Sabelli, uh, who teaches at St. Vincent, actually, and whom I've had the pleasure of getting to know just because of her being in the area, always insists on this point, and very rightly so. Um, but beyond that, then you have the, in, the, the infusion of, of grace. And so we're going to end up talking about that in the overall architecture of the virtues. But at the level of just Aristotelian analysis, what are what's the purpose of the virtu of the acquired natural virtues? So, you know, ultimately the the schema breaks out along the lines for Aristotle and then it's taken up by Stoics for instance of various stripes along the lines of prudence, justice, fortitude or courage and temperance. Now, there are many more virtues. We'll mention that very soon here. Um, I should have had, I've got every other chart under the sun up here, but, oh, I do have, I do have my virtue chart in front of me. Uh, but by our choices, we're going to have a real important co contrast here when we start talking about the life of grace. But through our choices, we slowly but surely move from having mere dispositions and the basic desire to do that which is good to potentially if we are reared in the right environment if we make the right choices over our lifetime to have stable states of soul that enable us within the context of our particular circumstances within the context of our particular environment the unique situation in which we find ourselves to make choices that are truly in line with the ends of what it means to be a, a reasonable or rational creature who's meant to live a social existence with other persons, in communion with other persons, trying to achieve those goods which are befitting of a human person. In other words, we look to act in a, ra in a rational manner, but that sounds a little bit too... Like, you know, we're trying to be like a robot. What is meant by this in Aristotle is there clearly is an end to the human person naturally, setting aside all those controversies about nature and grace in that regard. But there, there's a cluster of perfection that befits us as humans. And above all, you know, our ability to know other things, to know other persons, to uh, show to show the deference, respect, gratitude, Kindness, geniality, inventiveness, artist craft, all of that, that would be befitting of being people together, above all, philosophizing together for Aristotle, is the mark of a truly lived human life. And so the person who, for example, would, would not see that you shouldn't drink so much that it ruins your relationships is someone who's way beyond the pale for the, the having of the virtue of temperance, technically the virtue of sobriety in Aristotle's world. Um, all of these virtues are built up through the repetitive uh, activity that we have, uh, that we exercise, slowly but surely passing from a state of being mediocre, which is where he thinks most people are. Very rarely is someone fully vicious. Very rarely does someone not see that they should have done something better, right? That's the thing that always saves us is deep down in our will, even when we sin in Christian terms, we often can be reasoned with, right? We say, yeah, I know I shouldn't have done it, but it tasted good. Yeah, I shouldn't have done it, but well, I was afraid. Or yeah, I shouldn't have done it, but I didn't want to get in trouble with my wife. Um, you know, that kind of basis of potential reforming is what's always there for us to start making right choices, that we slowly build the character so that when we really have to do something that's difficult, we have the stable disposition in place to guide us toward those virtuous ends. So those who come to be called the acquired virtues or the moral virtues, and I'll, I'll probably... Um, refer to them by both both phrases, both expressions. 
they perfect different parts of our soul for Aquinas. Prudence, uh, and for Aristotle too, it's just clearer by the time you get to Aquinas and the, and the scholastics. Uh, prudence perfects our intellect as moral and practical. Prudence is the virtue that's not merely that famous line, you know, from George Bush, don't, you know, better to be prudent, right? Don't, don't take risks. That's not what prudence means. Prudence actually means being ready to command yourself to do that, which is right, the means of your action being achieved. And you must have your, your mind purified so that you're ready to be able to make both the choices, the judgment, well, the judgments, ultimately the, cho the ultimate choice that's measured by that judgment, and then command yourself to do what you, you need to do. The whole treatise on human acts is really analyzing the stages that are involved in that. But it perfects at once our mind and our will. It perfects at once our mind and our will. Because in order to make a choice, because no finite choice, no choice of action that we have will ever slake the deep desire that we have for the good or ultimately for God, we have to have a will that's ready and, and virtuous to be able to actually bring us to our last decision. St. Thomas is not an intellect, a pure intellectualist in the sense that prudence would just be the intellect moving along, just moving the will. It's quite clear that the intellect and the will have co-causality in this, um, we should say mutual causality, not co-causality, because that sounds a little bit too much like Suarez, but um, in other domains, but it has mutual causality, that the intellect knows uh, that which it should know, and the will exerts and wills it gives the the efficient causality and the two play together and this is the great mystery of how our character is involved in our moral choices father Gregory lagrange has great essays on it and others have noted this of course in the tradition as well that mind and heart must come together in the virtue of prudence and here i guess we should make a, a remark about you know the the cortege of virtues that surround all of these cardinal virtues because the cardinal virtues are like the hinges on which our moral life swings. Latin is from that. But each of them have various associated parts, and we don't need to worry about the technical terminology for that, the kinds of parts that there are. But just in the case of prudence, you, you have to have lots of different dispositional qualities to make you morally ready to practically and morally reason. You need to have a memory for instance, that is not affected by your biases or your fears or your bad reactions to the past, right? That you can't face up to the past, that you look at your past and you still let it be colored by all of your biases. You have to be rightly docile to listen to people who can give you advice, although you need to listen only to the right amount, not too much. You need to ultimately be shrewd enough to be able to see and with have a character that's ready to, to admit what path should be taken. You're going to need while you're acting to have foresight and caution because there will be many evils. Even once you've chosen what you should do, you're still going to have to navigate all of the difficulties and evils of this world. Guess what? Whenever people tell you that the, the old timers and scholastics were legalists, I can find you many, many in the tradition that's very dear and close to my heart that had just as much um, appreciation for the suppleness of moral reasoning and all the great number of, of, of uh, considerations that must be taken into account through foresight, circumspection, and caution, as any Jesuit today might try to impugn the past about. But there are even different kinds of prudence, according to Aquinas, that statecraft requires a kind of prudence that's different than the home life, which is different than personal prudence. Technically, there's also military prudence as well, because you've got to defend, and that's different than ruling. Um, but the point being is, whenever I talk about these cardinal virtues, in the case of them, there's... Uh, there's a whole host of sub-virtues around each of them. And you could do this for each of each of them, for courage, for for temperance, and of course, above all, for, for the case of justice. Justice is at once, you know, the hardest core of the virtues, but it's the most beautiful. It's maybe not the most beautiful, but it's perhaps the, it is 
the most striking of the more purely moral virtues, actually, because the virtue of religion is is one of the the it's the highest of all the moral virtues, actually. Um, but also, too, you have friendliness uh, is is under justice as well. All of these, um, you know, interactions that we have with others, um, you know, friendship liberality the the ability to to be ready to give money just because it's good to to be generous right like that's basically it should be you should have the character that if you have more means you should just be readily generous when it's appropriate it's not really a strict duty but it makes you know it makes for you to be you know a fully just person there's a beautiful set of reflections on these these virtues that go beyond you know just mere tit for tat um in Joseph Pieper's Four Cardinal Virtues. I still remember being struck by it years ago, left a deep, deep impression. Gratitude is a type of justice. And it's distinct, but it's a debt of justice. So it's, you know, Father Michel Labradet said in his, his, his text on justice, these mimeograph notes that eventually were published just recently in French, that, uh, you know, too cheaply we say, be charitable. Right, be charitable, be charitable, be charitable. I wasn't charitable, Father. No, you have to you have to actually confess that you weren't just, that you were unjust by being unfriendly. Charity has its own lofty goals, and we're going to talk about it soon. But so our intellect needs to be perfected as well as our will, so that we can choose and do what we need to do, and that's the virtue of prudence. The virtue of justice attunes our will for our relations with others. It perfects the human will, and it's the highest of, of the virtues because it's the most intellectual, setting aside prudence because prudence has this an amphibious nature of being at once intellectual and moral. The moral virtue of prudence trains our will to be ready to recognize that which is due to others, owed to others, other persons, other institutions, our nation, to God, to friends, etc., these this is a these are all perfections all these various forms of justice are perfections of the human will and they'll they'll have effects on the rest of the person no doubt because the will will be involved in using our lower powers and it will resound upon our passions but primarily the virtue of justice is concerned about perfecting the will and the choicest instruments for for the perfection of our uh, our desires, our passions of desire, or the concupiscible passions, is the virtue of temperance, right? That we need to have desires that are ready to be ruled by reason. That doesn't mean that our desires go away. It means, however, that as we reason to what we should do, even if we have desire, right? Eh, it'd be nice after a long day to have a beer readily enough. You know, I can always wait, go, you know, have one with my with my wife and maybe, you know, the kids are down. Maybe we'll watch something other than the, the Mighty Weasel on TV. Um, but, you know, you, you're, you hopefully have the desire that's in line to be obedient to the rule of reason. Not because reason is just pushing the passions down, although that is necessary often. Even Aristotle says people are too attached to desire. So you generally have to aim against it. Um, you need asceticism. But that's not what temperance is doing. It's not a, a full stoic purging. It's it's rendering the desires, we could say, illuminated, making them illuminated by the ends, the higher ends of human reason. Temperance is a set of, temperance and the various attached virtues are tools that are used in view of the human ends that above all are, are given actually through justice. That you see, injustice is much warmer than just tit for tat. So please remember that that relations with others need the tools of courage and, and temperance in order to, to enable us to actually have those relationships with others. So the same thing goes here for courage and its related, um, its related virtues as well. You must not get, you must not let fear get in the way of defending the nation or defending your household or just defending, you know, someone who's a, you know, a fellow classmate, if you're some, if you're a kid, right? You know, you know, you have to be ready to defend someone against bullying, 
Um, and yet you also have to have you know patience and ability to suffer through painful things that that would you know that would make you want to run away and be filled with fear, but you have 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 a patience to deal with it. Um, I mean, how often is this something we have to exercise? I mean, especially if we're touched with a, a bit of anxiety. Um, you have to have magnanimity, which is the greatest of the, the passages, I think, in the McMickian ethics sometimes um, about the, the Greek man who strides with his gaze fixed high and he doesn't chirp quickly like I do, right? He speaks with a low and serious voice and he knows that he must do great deeds. And think about this as a virtuous person, it's a person who's got great virtue great talent and great virtue, must do virtuous deeds, must conquer the truly human ends and not trifle with small things. You know, this is magnanimity. It sounds like pride, but that's not what, what Aristotle is getting at. Pride is, is opposed to it. Um, but uh, or we could say, you know, an over-desire for glory as opposed to it. But you know, it depends on how you want to cut your words up. But all, all I'm saying is that uh, magnanimity is is this great virtue for Aristotle. It's the, the height of courage. So courage or fortitude and its related virtues slowly but surely build up the character of, of your irascible appetite. But the Christian vocation goes infinitely higher than this. And ultimately, in the end... Our activity is necessary, but grace has the first operation because we are not merely given virtues that are natural, that are just these acquired virtues that the philosophers speak of. We are above all given the three great properties that flow from the essence of grace. Grace, to the degree it can be theologically explained by, by anyone. The Thomists use the notion it's sort of like a, an accident, but it's substantial in character. Grace alters the deepest part of the soul. It's like a new substance grafted onto our nature. Our obediential potency, our openness, our, in the Thomist case, our negative openness, our readiness with an open hand for the gift of grace is then lifted up and fulfilled, but infinitely more, by the gift of the divine life that shines by, by the gift of God through, you know, the act of faith, which finds its place in the context of the uh, sacrament of baptism, or at least in voto, in desire, whether explicitly or implicitly. But let's use the normal case of baptism. <laughs> that then flowing from the baptismal character which is a, a kind of sacramental grace, we, have the, we also have our habitual grace that divinizes the depths of our soul. And we are, we are then flooded with the light of God such that our minds and wills are changed, that our spiritual faculties are cut to the measure of the divinity, that our intellect begins to be able to grasp here below, only on the attestation of God who reveals through the mediacy of his church, but primarily and formally because God reveals the inner truths of the mystery of the Godhead revealed in the economy of salvation and all the things that are related to that. All the supernatural mysteries of the Trinity and Christ, the church, the sacraments, moral, the moral concepts that go with theology, the theological virtues, all of these are revealed truths that we know, we truly know, just as we know by, by human faith, we know, I know something about Switzerland by talking to people about Switzerland. Much more infinitely, God comes and gives us the illumination and also the knowledge of supernatural mysteries, but on his authority through faith. So it's through the veils of faith here below. But that which we know supernaturally through the veils, through supernatural faith, here below, we will see in full vision in the hereafter, because faith itself is a kind of beginning of eternal life, so long as it also is accompanied by the full flowering and desire that should come with it, right? Hope, we'll talk about in a moment, and charity. Hope and love, whatever we want to call it. 
the love of God poured out into our hearts such that our will takes the greatest of all rest in God for his own sake, that we love God for him, himself, for his supernatural self. We love God with a reflection of the Trinitarian love itself. That's what charity is. And it enables us to have the great prerogative to steal a phrase from uh, Cardinal Journet, to give God back to God through the mediacy of all of our actions, to be drawn in our own creaturely reflection into the dynamic of the Trinitarian self gift that goes on in the flash of eternity through the perichoresis of the persons, unchangingly and unwaveringly giving themselves to each other. Our wills are stamped with this through the gift of, through the theological virtue of charity. Through it, we are most loftily cut to the divine image. And through hope, because we don't yet, we have not yet achieved our beatitude, we incline ourselves toward our salvation with the sure, let's not be circular, not hope, but the, the sure um, readiness and acceptance that God is present as the just rewarder and the one who gives grace and the one who supports his people Israel and his people now redeemed through Christ, through all of the, the hardships on this mortal coil that is earth, through all the sufferings, through all the frustrations, through all, through all the distance, through all the unknowing. And all of this is given as, as a series of gifts through grace. It's you, you cannot, you cannot by any uh, count build up the, the quality of these virtues the way that you build up through other acts in the natural order, the natural virtues of, of prudence, justice, temperance, um, courage. At most, you can merit. This is where the theology of merit is very important because the growth of these virtues comes, yes, because we have done acts of supernatural faith, hope, and charity. We can merit an increase in the grace in the sense that God, out of justice in a way, and the divine justice, owes to us that which he has already given to us. He crowns, he crowns the gifts that he has given in that line from Augustine. It's in, I think it's in one of the preface of saints in the, the Novus Order of the Roman, right? At least I don't know if it's in the, the old form. Uh that when God gives his gifts, he but crowns the, the crowns our merits, he but crowns the gifts that he has already given. And it's because we merit these that God then gives the growth in his good time. And so all the discussion of merit in the treatise on grace falls under this dynamic in the theological virtues. And we'll see also soon enough in the other suit all the supernatural virtues. But there's because there's more here to talk about. Um that we grow in the very gift of the divine life. And these will be faith and hope will even pass away, but charity will remain because the full substance of what is, is held in faith and hope is, is in charity. And indeed through charity, we have our closest contact with God. And it's important to see as well. Let's come back to be charitable to others. The, the term charity and love is, you know, used to talk about our relationships with others, but let's be careful fraternal charity is indeed the utter self-giving love that Christ describes in the gospel. But let's not reduce it to the affability of, of certain social justice -y types. Social justice isn't a bad thing, and we own it because of Luigi Taparelli. But let us not reduce charity merely to a friendliness and a kindness and an outpouringness to others. That's justice. That's liberality. That's what we owe pagans owe that. To, to, uh, to themselves as humans. We are cut to the lo very love that's self-giving on, on the Christ-formed model, right? It's something that it makes, my, makes me shake in my boots all the time because I know the comforts of my own existence. And so, uh, you know, boy, really, am I, am I living that? Fraternal charity is the stamp of brotherly love we have with all who all are at least potentially our brethren all are at least potentially in a state of grace and we have a hope not a hope that all necessarily be saved let us not go down a universalist 
position. But we do have a, a good hope that, that God is the merciful father who, who reigns on the good and evil, his grace. And for that reason, all are potentially our brothers and sisters, and we are to, to love them with the very love of God given to us. That in a, in a way, God has given us, yes, in his church, yes, above all in the, the Eucharist, but the other sacraments, but above all in the Eucharist, a, a sort of replacement for his physical presence because he's now given us his sacramental presence, his mystical presence in the, in the sacraments. He's also given us in others. He means it when he says that you, the, 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 what you do for the least of these, you do for me. That he's there. And that's what fraternal charity is about. And that's why it demands so much more than what the friendly, you know, reformers of theology who think that scholastic theology doesn't, you know, doesn't have warmth to it. It doesn't have, um, you know, uh, it doesn't have human depth. Oh, it has all the depth that can help to give some articulation to the visage of Christ presented to us in the Gospels. And that's fraternal charity. But of course, fraternal charity is always love of neighbor, ultimately for the sake of the love of God, because we are communicating the, the divine love itself. But because we have, we're being cut to an end that infinitely exceeds us, and the, in the Christian East, the, they're very well aware of this uh, because of you know, things in, in Gregory of Nyssa, but in the Cappadocians in general, and then above all in the developments in the Palamite world, uh, of the, the infinite distance that still separates us from the uncreated life of God. We need assistance. We need assistance to actually live up to our faith, hope, and charity. We need a docility to God that enables us to sail on the divine wind that should, how often does it? And I'm saying this is self-accusation, but should sail on, on the winds of the Holy Spirit. And that's the role of, in the West, it develops stylistically in this Augustinian air. We can do whatever we want. I'm not going to make the point. I'm just going to teach the Thomas stuff. But it's there in the tradition, in other words, in other ways. I'm fine with theological pluralism. I personally have just benefited so much from the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the discussion of the gifts of the Holy Spirit by the Thomists. Taking that text out of Isaiah, we end up with, the mystical gifts of, of uh, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. We need to penetrate the mysteries through an unknowing. We have to even know created realities in their, in their finitude and their emptiness. Change and decay all around I see, but thou who changest not abide with me. The gift of knowledge helps you to look and see created realities in their finitude. But what you know through faith, you have to realize how even through the unchanging formulas that you'll never get past because they're absolutely necessary. Nonetheless, you're touching a reality that exceeds infinitely what you ever could grasp through the gift of supernatural faith. That's the gift, the gift of understanding. And the gift of wisdom, what's beautiful and the highest of them is, these are not replacements for the theological virtues, but the greatest of their tools. The gift of wisdom enables our soul to be ready for the passive mystical experience. All of these are passive. They're, they, they enable us to act in a, a divine mode beyond even the human mode, although they fittingly take us to the heights of our vocation through grace. And through wisdom, we taste God active in his mystery in our soul, that our charity itself, that our love, which is closest in its contact to God, becomes the means of knowing that love passes over into the condition of being an, the object that we know. And we taste through an unknowing, through a, and it's the gustare, come and taste, come and, come and savor the mysteries, God active in the soul. And of course, also, there are, we need the counsel of God to give us direction in our choice, in our choices, God must, you know, the, the spirit must, you know, tell you what to say, even though you've, you know, not prepared, um, you know, you've not prepared ahead of time for, for this. Right. Um, and also too, 
we must be ready to have a piety, a devotion um, to 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 God that that outstrips even what we would be able to achieve merely through you know the virtue of religion. And I'm going to have more to say here in just just a moment about the the virtue uh, virtue of religion as well. We must have a great courage to be able to 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 stand up with fortitude against. Uh, the evils, evils of the world. And so the gifts of the Holy Spirit function as the, the choice means for being able to stand up to the infinite call that we're called to through grace. These are not gifts like the freely given gifts, tongues, prophecies, whatever. They're important. Those are important charismatic gifts that are of use for the building up of the body of Christ. These are the mystical, even in their most most active forms, the mystical adaptation of our soul to passively be the instruments of God. There's a beautiful image, I think, and if I'm changing it, I apologize to someone like Father Dominic Legg, but I, I think I remember this from his text. Profound analogy that goes on here. I like I said, I may have digested this and made it my own. And so let's just say it's mine inspired by what he says when he talks about the theandric acts of Christ. You know, Christ acts precisely as the word, instrumentally using his human nature. I mean, we see this especially in, of course, the, the act of redemption, but also, too, in his forgiving of sins. Christ as man does it, but as instrument of the divinity. But really also in, in, in all of Christ's acts, the Holy Spirit is specially operative in the activity of the word through the human nature of Christ. And although he has, yes, properly human acts, they are influenced by a passivity to the word and to the Holy Spirit. Because here we can say there's a passivity in the human nature of Christ, not the word being passive to the Holy Spirit, but the human nature of Christ having operative the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's full of the Spirit, right? This was not just a throwaway word. That Christ as man has this immense theandric passivity to the divinity. And we get to participate that in that in our own little creaturely mode, having some small taste in truly acting, even as the word did, the incarnate word. But that's just a... A thought there to have. But let's finish by noting another important point, which, although I, I suspect that the erudite listeners, you know, you're all very well informed. I'm always very impressed. You, you probably have some inkling of this, but I've known very good, you know, uh, people who become Thomists through the back door who were surprised to know that there are other moral virtues for the Thomists. As a theological position, and one which I think, uh, although it is not de fide, is uh, well-reasoned theologically, the Thomistic school notes that with these new ends that we have through faith, hope, and charity, the whole radiance of grace in our human person, we stand in need of tools also for our interactions with other people, our desires, and our fears and anger. Desires and joys, really. Let's always say that for concupiscence. But um, we need to have the means that fit the new supernatural end that we have through faith, hope, and charity. We need to have new virtues, that there are virtues that are infused. Now, there's a whole literature about, well, did these do away with the natural virtues or not? I say they don't, but that's highly technical discussion that we don't need to get into. And the school generally at least says this as well, that the Christian has the gift through baptism, or at least in voto, right? In, in desire, the, uh, the virtues of a Christian sort of justice and all of its related virtues, a Christian sort of temperance, a Christian sort of prudence, putting on the mind of Christ in that regard too a Christian sort of courage. The, the Christian will fast in a way, will need to fast in a way that's more than just for health and relationships. The Christian will need also just to forego, you know, pleasures 
for the sake of for the sake of living out whatever's called we're called to do in our life supernaturally. Krishna will be called to a self a self gift that's even you know even more than the parent who doesn't get sleep, and we need to have the character qualities that that help with that that help mold our desires shape our desires not merely our intellect and our will as is the case for the theological virtues but our desires themselves need to have a disposition in them that is supernaturalized that has a reflection of christ all the way down into those lowest reaches of our souls the incarnation goes deep and it radiates down into the whole of the human person just as right, Christ is indeed truly and holy man, so too his grace radiates not merely through noose, not merely through, you know, making our, our mind and our will more lofty, but it comes down into even our will and its human relationships, as well as even the human relationship to our creator through supernatural religion. You know, how much how much more beautiful is a high mass or a a, a divine liturgy? And we can say that the divine liturgies perhaps always have a certain golden glory that goes with them a little bit more, but I'm not a low mass person, so I apologize. Um, but they have their place the kind of contemplative, especially I think for private recitation. But the glory of that outstrips those liturgies, outstrips the glory of mere natural religion, which is a good in itself too. And we could do this for all the other virtues down through our desires, down through our fears. That the light of Christ illuminates them and gives us a disposition so that we have the means at our disposal in our moral exercise, not merely the mystical uh, spiritual exercise of faith, hope, and charity, but even our moral activities will bear the direct stamp of Christ and the stamp of the cross here below, but also the stamp of glory in the hereafter. And these are called the infused moral virtues, and they function just like the theological virtues through a whole nexus of merit, because the growth is a reflection in the order of means, as means and tools for living of the divine life that is given in grace. And so we have here then in the virtues, this full radiation of beatitude throughout all of our activity, our activity of above all, the spiritual knowledge and love that we have through faith, hope, and charity, the tools which are like sails waiting for the gust of the Holy Spirit when he shall come to help and move us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But as a stable disposition, this readiness to passively receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and radiating through our moral being, this human nature, which has still remains, is also taken up and divinized in itself through the, the radiation of created grace through all of those powers giving us the infused moral virtues. It's a beautiful image to have whenever we consider the moral life and it helps you to see, especially if you have before yourself a full chart of all of these virtues, you know, the many tools that are at our disposal for analyzing the experience of the human life, but above all the Christian life. And it bears witness to both the loftiness of the gift that we've been given in grace, as well as how much God loves us to, to even enable day-to-day -day life to radiate with, with that gift down through all of these various sub-virtues and infused moral virtues and everything else. So on that, I'll let Michael manage the uh, questions. Excellent. Now we uh, have a caller here on hold who wanted to ask you a question uh caller you're live with reason and theology can you hear us yes sir i can hey what's going on michael hey how are you hey it's justin and before i ask my question i just want to again say thank you for doing shows like these and kind of bringing theology to i'm just a layman and making it more accessible to uh to, to the masses i really yeah. appreciate it thank you glad to do it it's my, pl my pleasure. Uh, Mr. Mr. My Myers, pleasure. Yeah, go ahead. I thought that was you, Justin, because you called last time. So I hope you're enjoying your beer mug. So, <laughs> but go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I am. I'm enjoying a nice glass of beer right now. Good. 
I'd like to maybe ask the question on the four cardinal virtues or the natural virtues and kind of build a construct and maybe construct of an idea and maybe have you comment or answer the question. Okay, yeah. I feel like the, the cardinal virtues really is a really good area of evangelization, uh, evangelization in our day uh, today because you have so much decadence or perversity. And I feel like even when someone without the supernatural gift of faith sees those natural virtues in the Christian, they see something that is unlike anything else that they see on social media, mass media, advertising to commercials. And it can be that starting point for opening up to, to supernatural grace and uh, theological discussions. And uh, my question really is for the virtue of fortitude and how maybe you see the virtue of fortitude being vital to being a theologian or to being in academia insofar as sometimes the truth that seems to me in some mainstream universities isn't necessarily uh, propounded on or given in all of its fervor. For example, you see Notre Dame and um, some of the classes that they teach and some of the stuff that they teach there. And I don't want to dig in tune Notre Dame. Sure. But you, could, you see where I'm taking uh, the yeah. spread for other Catholic, Catholic universities, Catholic schools in general. I'm, I'm sure you've mentioned before that you said once you decided to translate Gary B. LeBron, <laughs> I, you knew that it would be a detriment to your career. Yeah. So, so, so I, can, I don't know. I don't know if you could take it from there. Yeah, I'll I'll take it from there. I'll make I'll make comments on both of those because really you raised two good points there that I can I think jump off of. So thank you, Justin. Your comments are always great, both online and I like these by voice too. So, um, the first point you make is is so true. I mean, I was trying to I had to scale us all the way up in an hour to the theological virtues and their radiance. But it's amazing when you stop and think about the, the many moral truths that are taught by the church that are just natural. So, you know, I stress this when I teach. I'm just prepping a, a deacon course because we were doing it online this year and we spread them out over the year. Um, and so I'm doing the sexual ethics, uh, bioethics course this year. And when I do contraception, I make sure they know. I'm like, this is natural law stuff, guys. I mean, we may talk about how this applies also in the, the level of grace, but this is natural law. And this is the same kind of thing we can say in so many domains. Like, and like you said, it's a the, just the contrast of the, the exercise of the natural virtues that we're called to by as Christians already is a huge contrast to the, the rest of the culture. And it's a massively um, powerful evan evangelization tool for two reasons. One, because of course, wherever you have that goodness being exercised, the life of the virtue being exercised, people do see the beauty of it. If it's true virtue, right? People think of virtue as being ugly because people are pushy, but that's not a virtuous person, right? A virtuous person has the right tact to know how to be virtuous without being, you know, I don't want to throw the Flanders is under the bus from the Simpsons, but you know what the Flanders are made fun of for, um, or like the church lady, right? It's not just that it's actually something quite beautiful. And right there, the natural beauty of the virtues will already strike someone as being, you know, it's, like the ancient church, people say, you know, these people live differently. What's going on there? I want something to do with it. What's more, and I've, I've reflected on this in, in a lengthy, my footnotes are always the place to see where I'm musing in my articles. Each of the, the natural virtues have an obediential potency and openness for their supernatural correlate. So in the case, temperance is going to have an openness for supernatural temperance because it, it needs to direct you in the direction of those infused moral virtues. Otherwise, they'd be broken, right? Supernatural virtues would would seem irrational, but they're not. They're in line with the, the cardinal virtues just in the natural order. And so what you're doing is you're pointing in the direction of without giving, you're letting Christ come down. So without giving the answer, you're pointing in the direction of those supernatural realities. And in the end, they're all a reflection of God. Each of the virtues can be seen as a sort of reflection of the, of the you know, Singular goodness of God that's manifold on our side. The virtue of fortitude, and this is a you know good example. So the virtue of cur um, hope, so the theological virtue of hope, is above all deals with like our vocation and our um, uh, our 
uh, our life of grace. And so like our, our ability to know that, you know, to, to live as though we trust in God's uh, providence. However, fortitude, be it Christian fortitude or, or just the natural virtue of fortitude, is so necessary for dealing with the long suffering of life, the, the things that you would want to just, you know, run away from. And so, you know, as a, as a Catholic scholar, let alone the controversial topics, I'm teaching sexual ethics. You can think what that's like to put something in, you know, on a slide that's going to be floating around, you know, with my students. Nothing, you know, I'm very balanced. I'm not, I'm teaching what the church teaches. I'm not a fire thrower, but you have to have the courage to speak the truth to your students, no matter what the world, you know, might say. And you just have to also have the, the readiness to be able to respond, you know, without being angry whenever you're pushed. And the same thing goes for, you know, like the work you, like the work you do. I mean, I, I may be brash and prideful or also avoiding my other duties. So I'm not holding myself up as a model, but what do I pray for? And I mean, so really I'm trying to be both genuine and, and not self laudatory here. I pray that like when I made these decisions to do the sort of work that I'm doing, you know, that I'm, I, that I'm doing it for the service of the truth. And you know what? Yeah. It's kind of not going to get any recognition. And I have to like, suffer through not getting, you know, you know, recognition from those who are in power, but not going after those honors, because what are the honors of, of the empty laurels of the people at the CTSA, the Catholic Theological Society of America? Um, you know, honor is very often tied up with the virtue of fortitude, courage. So what is the sort of honor that you are, you're seeking? And you absolutely need this. You need this as a Christian trying to raise your children, right? You know, you want to be, you want to, you want your children to be honored for excellence and you want, you want your family, you know, to, to, to do good things uh, that then are recognized, not because you want to be recognized, but you want the good achievements to be recognized by the society. This is one of the frustrations of being a Christian in the decadent world in which we live. You know, the world's always decadent and our souls are decadent. So I'm not trying to be fire and brimstone, but is that the world doesn't honor the things that we honor. Well, you need you need to be able to not let that dissuade you though from living living the Christian life or being a good Christian scholar. That you need to have the character to to be ready to face the sufferings. Because actually Aristotle and Aquinas say that courage is more about suffering than about anger. To suffer the current state of affairs and then use that as the tool to be able to then stand up to the you know stand up to the culture in the sense of of not backing down before the tidal wave. Of, of a different worldview. Very important. So thank you. Very good question, Justin. Did you uh, have any... Uh, um, thank you. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, maybe I could contrib contribute two more ideas or and maybe then you can either comment or move on to the next. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, first idea is that of uh, fortitude insofar as it relates to Plato's cave. And I think the Matrix was also kind of modeled after that. Mm -hmm. You need the courage to be able to go outside the cave of whatever construct that the, for lack of better words, psychological warfare, social engineers, blah, 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 are trying to oppose on you and look at, at the Christian narrative or the Christian worldview and find out how you can courageously operate that in your own life. And then the second idea would be it's fascinating to me reading. The Jesuit relations, um, and they evangelized the, the Huron and Iroquois Nation of North America, and how they so used the natural virtues. I think one letter is saying um, the Native Americans value you being able to walk miles and miles and miles without rest. So those Jesuits walk yeah. miles and miles and miles without rest. Uh, yeah, no, that's and that's a, it is. It's a beautiful image to them. They say, "What in the world are these people?" Right? What is it that drives these people? If only the Jesuits would, would do that now, right? For the <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that first point, the first point you make is so important about the way that our our moral dispositions are necessary for grasping the truth. You know, one of the great battles between Blondell and Garrigan that made it happen was on this topic. Because Maurice Blondel always focused on the moral disposition you need in order to really even receive the truth. And they shot past each other for some real technical reasons. But it's very necessary to go out of the cave, 
to, you have to be drug out of the cave is how Plato puts it, right? And that's what it's often like. The dragging can be the slow process of getting the courage to be able to see the world outside of the cave and see reality. But boy, you need to have the character to be able to actually face what that truth Im implies for you. Yeah. Great, great points, Justin. Thanks. Thank you for your call, Justin. Those were excellent uh, questions there. Now, this one is from Thomas. How does uh, filial charity assimilate us to the Holy Spirit for our way to glory? Uh, or is that another distinction in the expression of charity and not filial? You know, I'd have to actually look and see the text if it's not, if it's, you know, if if it's the antecedent, where the antecedent's going there. Um, filial charity, though, does assimilate us, make us like, it likens us unto the, the Holy Spirit in a particular way, especially when you're looking at this this theology, the, the language of the, the proper names to the, the persons in, in the Thomists of gift, that the Holy Spirit is a gift. And so filial charity becomes the living of the life of God for others like but once again it's not the friendliness thing that people make it out to be it's the very uncreated life of god being given to others in our acts right that's why christ describes these as they're so immensely self-giving not because it's ge just generousness it's the person of the word doing these acts and being present to others and we too are supposed to be doing that kind of act and because it's the it's a kind of gift in the sense it's the giving of that life in our activity, that would make for a good analogy to the Holy Spirit as gift. So you would have an assimilation. You know, This is the, the idea of appropriation of, of names to the person of the Spirit. I, I would That's me venturing a guess for you. So I think it works, even if it's not what Gary recommended. I'm trying to see if there's any others here. I'm not seeing it offhand if y'all can put them to at reason in theology because i see a lot of comments but I'm trying to see which one of them yeah there are a lot of comments might, might be questions yeah i'm not seeing offhand so i'll give y'all just a few more seconds here to post them otherwise uh we'll leave it at that yeah i'm not seeing any going once going twice all right, we'll go ahead and uh, leave it there. Uh, you know, Dr. Minard, I always appreciate you coming on and doing this. I have one question for you before uh, before you go. You were talking about the uh, estimative power. Yeah. Um, I've always found that fascinating. And so, yeah, one of the well, let me go grab for you something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, your guys, someone asked me about doing like a walkthrough of the, the random books I had. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that's actually called in the case of. Uh, humans, because the estimative power, the ability to, to, to the animals have instinctually to know what they should do, should, should right. flee from or should ignore, right. Right. Uh, becomes called the cogitative power. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. The discursive power. There's a great essay by Daniel DeHan on this. Now he's developing, you know, he's actually developing a good bit from the people he cites. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's still very brilliant. I don't want to, to tie away from it, but if you read his footnotes, mm -hmm. some of those things in the footnotes are very good as well. Uh, even better than what I'm about to show you, but this is the classic study and it's so beat up. It's like this dissertation published by Father Klubertans. <laughs> so <laughs> like, oh, nice. So I didn't know the discursive power was the same thing as cogitative power. Yeah, well, because that's just the idea that it's it's particular reason, right? You can see universals in individuals. <sighs> Uh, okay, so I thought that for humans, cogitative was, let's say I'm just kind of on autopilot driving home and I'm not even thinking about the directions, but I end up home. Isn't so, that the cogitative? That's a mixture of memory and the cogitative power. Because remember, okay. so one thing about memory that's very important to remember is memory holds the intentions that the cogitative power makes. Okay, okay. So, like, because think of our memory, because and this is so important in the spiritual life that we remember things with that halo of like, did we like it or not? Or did, should we have done it or not? Mm -hmm. And that halo is, that's the, that's the kind of knowledge that comes from the, the, the estimative sense. Uh, so it, yeah, for us, the cogitative power, it is that because it's just functioning mm -hmm. at the sort of animal level. But mm -hmm. think about the scientist, for instance, the mm -hmm. scientist thinks about possible things to do in an experiment. And he's got this mixture of intellect and cogitative power doing an sure. immense amount of work together that you're trying to see in these particular experiences. It's an experimentum. You're trying to come up with a, a single case that matches what you need. Mm. And I, 
as a as a it, all you have to do is go look in any of my essays where I touch on this at all. If you just go and click on a couple of my website, you'll find a link to that thing by Daniel DeHaan. Or you'll see the mm-hmm. citation. And he he works out about the the way that this is involved in our our affective grasp. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So like you can't do the passions without seeing how the estimative sense is involved. Mm-hmm. And you can't do moral action without seeing how prudence is using the estimative sense to get that one case that I'm going to do right now. Mm-hmm. To the point I'd have to go back through the literature. I mean, there were some who who wanted to read Aristotle saying prudence um, perfected the cogitative power, not not the practical intellect as intellect. Um, it's definitely deeply involved memory, memory and, and shrewdness. Are, are perfecting our, our cogitative power. Now, in the case of animals, however, um, you know, I could see maybe um, a dog gets bitten by another dog so he knows next time that he sees a dog to run away or something. But how do we account for things like birds knowing where to fly at certain seasons even the though they've sense. never done it before? Sense. And how does that happen since they've never themselves encountered well and that's yeah i mean that's an example of like how the wire like so all that neural wiring is part of the the ability that you're preloaded with i mean babies do this too even though like we're so plastic you know anyone who's had a child whose whose mother has you know basically not had trouble being able to to nurse right the child a child that knows how to nurse can at least Mm -hmm. do that immediately Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know yeah so that's, you know, they're able to, there, there are certain things in the environment that the bird knows how to calculate off of, mm-hmm. right? And it, so it sees, you know, we're tuned to being in our intellect. They're tuned to that environment, mm. right? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Okay. So it's not yeah, necessarily I mean, something that they have to learn. It could just be innate. Yeah, it's a mix, right? It's a mixture, right? They have these innate these innate abilities that they, you know, they somehow are sometimes are trained like the weasels, right? I was watching the weasels the other day. Um, and there was this poor little weasel that was abandoned. And so the guy was you know, playing with the weasel every day. Cause that's how they of course learn, right? They learn how to hunt by playing with each other, but they have this initial instinct to, to do the playing, right? The idea that when there's another weasel or weasel like thing around me, I have to, you know, bite and play. So that's all the estimatives. That's the estimative sense. And then slowly but surely memory in the estimative sense in the case of the animal, right, are playing off of each other. And then all of that comes under the under the aegis of reason. And that's why the Aristotelians talk about the, the estimative sense becoming really powerful as the cogitative power. Because in order to see, think about it someday, whenever you stop and think about how, the experience of seeing universals in particulars, right, you take for granted all the books behind you. Right. But the experience of knowing that that is a book Mm-hmm. There's there's almost a poetic intuition you have whenever you see these sorts of things. Sometimes, whenever now, you see the, animals, they yeah. they don't have that ability. Correct, appreciate. correct. What they would, I mean, you know, this is somewhat beyond my pay grade to not sound like I'm just being a foolish repeater of the the tradition here. Mm-hmm. But it's a it's a primarily action oriented knowledge that animals have, mm-hmm. right? It is. It's an action oriented knowledge. These are the sort of things that I will do, not do, or 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 flee from. Right which is different than speculative articulation of the quote, quote, est, the what things are, the, and the essences of things. One apologetic I heard for that, that I was reading, I think it was in uh, Adler, uh, Adler. Oh, Mortimer Adler. Yeah. yeah. Don't ever make fun of old Mort. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Adler who was saying that, you know, they, they aren't able to extract particulars from universals. And one of the reasons we know that is they don't have language, culture, religion and all of those things would have to have that if if i recall correctly yeah, that's i mean that is that's usually it's you know very often because of the close the close relationship between our knowledge and the instrument that is language is often used in these discussions um you know i'd, I'd have to go through I, I had to edit something for one of our maritime volumes where someone dealt with some of that literature mm. um i think that's that's a very important world for all of this to be developed. So you see, you can see this is the perennial usability of the old philosophy. Like it can just be opened up to all that. Yeah. Right. And it can, it can, it can assimilate that data without destroying it. Like it lets all of the, the, the animal psychology stick around. And it's so important actually for trying to understand us, the whole of the Freudian subconscious, 
mostly gar not I, from what I understand from the psychologist, it's mostly garbage. But the idea of subcon the subconscious is all that stuff that's not articulated, that's down under our surface. And that's something that stays. We have intentions, so it's not just, it, we all know this. It's the idea of repressed thoughts and repressed experiences that people have, sometimes tragically. Um, they're not articulated at an intellectual level, just like driving, but it's way worse that you have to pull them up to rationality. So that whole, once again, that you can develop all that with all the tools of the developed psychological sciences, you know, to the degree that they're doing this sort of thing. And uh, that Daniel DeHand is actually doing these kind of things at Oxford. Um, it's uh, it's all this stuff that's not not at the level of the intellect at all. Like it, it sometimes goes down into like the deepest nether regions of the estimative part of our cogitative power, mm -hmm. right? It's not even doing cogitation. It's, it's just down at that animal level. And then it fires off emotions. You know, or it's it's involved with the passions that are down there that are just pre-rational. Hmm. Very fascinating stuff, and it's so important for like spiritual life, for the for moral theology. So much cool stuff. Yeah, and and it also touches on you know what's the fundamental difference between us and animals, you know, and how would you uh, how would you answer that to somebody who doesn't already affirm Christianity? Yeah, no, that's I mean, it is hard. I'll just admit that it's hard, right? I mean, you really have to prep. You have to prep pretty well on whatever the state of the science is about animal cognition to try mm -hmm. and contrast it with what intellectual cognition looks like. And it's best, it is always best to get down into some of that anthropology of language and how language and culture interact because that's so ubiquitous. Some, some scholastics get a little nervous because it sometimes sounds like a kind of nominalism that you're going to make intellection intrinsically dependent on language. Well, even if it's not intrinsically dependent, it base it is de facto dependent mm. in our embodied state. You can't have you can't really have a discussion of analogical terms or any of that. You need terms. You need you need the the tool of of language. Mm. Monsignor Sokolowski, I, the parts of my brain that are triggering now when I did that with my hand, he mm. used to insist on this all the time in graduate school, um, all the time. Yeah. That'd be a, a whole fun uh, show a show that would be really fun to do if we did a whole one on it. <laughs> it would be great. I mean, if you could get if you could get Doctor DeHand, he'd be he'd be great. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. Yeah, I think we might have to do that. I think that would be fun, and I've long wanted to do that. Just didn't know who who would be. <laughs> be I, yeah, I think he'd be he'd be great. I mean, I don't. I met him once. We went to he went to the University of St. Thomas. Um, he, uh, but yeah, I think he'd be he'd be really a good one to have on. Awesome. Uh, I thought I saw one more question. Uh, somebody was asking, do you have also um, a degree in psychology? I, I think somebody asked. <laughs> no, I don't. No, no, no. <laughs> no. But it might seem that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe, you know, you it's, it's the risk of when you do like philosophy and theology, right? Like that you, everything fits subrazione entis and subrazione deitatis. Everything fits under that. So you that's the, the danger. That's why you have to know. You really have to know who's the expert so you can immediately, once you get down beneath that nice thin veneer that you're at, that you can point someone to the expert then on it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you uh, clarifying that there. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to see if there's any others, but I'm not seeing any offhand. So we'll go ahead and call it there. Again, thank you for coming on, Dr. Miner. It's always Great. an honor and a pleasure. And I look forward to having you on again for some more. Uh, what, what's the next one going to be on? I actually I forgot about it. I guess I'm on that round table next week. Uh, let me see. Because Are there emotions or did you did you? Uh, I'm trying to see here. The 8th or something. It's Monday. Uh, Monday. I see St. Genis. Yeah. So you're going to be on with that one. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. So yeah. I'm, yeah. that would be fun. I'm not sure what to expect actually there. So I'm going to get to be the curmudgeonly Thomas in the room. I was saying to Elijah the other day on a show that, look, it's not like I'm going to be able to tell him something he doesn't already know about this issue. So what does he know that I don't know <laughs> that he's maintaining that position? You know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That's I don't know well enough. It's, but how, it's up his sleeve. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I I remember Maritan at one point. It was old. It's in one of his last volumes. He's frustrated. He's like, you know, I had a conversation with a priest, 
who basically said, well, yeah, but you know, the Old Testament said that God, you know, God uh, mourned or whatever, you know, be it something in Genesis or something. Right. And Meriton was just flummoxed. He was like, so we'll throw divine immutability overboard because of a crappy exegesis. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, so I can't imagine that's what's going on, you know? Surely not. <laughs> so... so I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what his reaction is going to be. You know, he doesn't know me, so I can't come yeah. and just be like, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Thomas is like, yeah, trust me, I know what Thomas are like. So they're just going <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, to you. We'll try that. <laughs> I look forward to it. So again, we'll have you on uh, soon. Do you do you know um, what the next one on the Summa will be on? Yeah, so we'll be finishing off here, right? The Prima Secundae. Yeah. And so we'll move into. Uh, the it's mostly the treatise on law. Mm -hmm. Talk talk a bit about sin, but mostly about treatise treatise on law, really, um, be because I think there's just neat stuff neat stuff in there that we can do because that'll give us a chance to talk about the natural law and other things like that, and then the eternal law and the then the foreshadowing of the new law, which is the law of grace and the old in the old law. So excellent. Well, again, I look forward to that. And everybody, thank you all for your participation there in the chat. Justin, thank you for your call. That was great. And also uh, check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us. Until next time. God bless.